The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. Let's talk about the movie with the line, I'm not a citizen, I'm a rebel. It's not V for Vendetta, it's the Shira movie. What the fuck? Um. Hey everyone, this is Michael T. Bradley. This is Marisha Parker. And we are here to talk about the She-Ra, He-Man movies, Secret of the Sword, Power of Love and a Sword. Yes, or, that catastrophe. Right, something like that, where we, we don't even remember the name. It's available on YouTube, so play along at home if you dare. Let's see, the basic, basic plot out of the way first. First four episodes of the She-Ra ongoing series prince adam finds out he has a twin sister who's in a different realm and he goes and gives her a sword and she realizes she can become shira yeah that's that's a pretty quick overview there. let's go ahead and start with our what the fuck moments all right i uh let's see here i'll i'll start this out i love the line not another door i liked the horde of robots wielding hitachi magic wands he man punches a fucking tank in the evil base, the button to use the intercom is the same button you use to fire a death laser. Later, He-Man punches another fucking tank. And an evil robot calls a Pegasus a flying horsey. Hordak turns into a fucking rocket. <laughs> Talking about Hordak, which, by the way, did you notice this is this film's 30th anniversary? This is the 30-year anniversary of the... I, I did not notice that. Yeah, and it's not actually a film, so I don't know if it counts, but it's the 30-year anniversary of the uh, the Shira cartoon premiering, so that's very exciting. This is this is actually a, a <laughs> big, big tie-in. They hired us for this. Yay, Mattel! I think I realized when I watched this, the thing that really excited me about this cartoon as a kid, and it's because... He-Man always existed in this weird, Caucasian-centric world, and it's very similar in She-Ra, and I couldn't put this into words at the time, but He-Man's very like this fantasy world, and there are monsters, and that's what Skeletor and all his gang are. She-Ra's world, Etheria, was that her world? Or yeah, that was hers. Etheria is a world in which, you know, Sauron is one, essentially. It is a world in which the bad guys are the ruling power. And they have all this, like, complicated technology that isn't as effective as it should be, but it's, but it's pretty cool looking. Yeah, I definitely want to talk about what kind of engineer Hordak has uh, here in a bit. Right. But, but yeah, first, the, um, uh, but, but just to get that out of the way, that was, I think that was what drew me. To this series, and if I remember correctly, pretty quickly the series devolves into basically just a cheap He-Man knockoff, except with a girl. But I really liked that aspect of, you know, we're the rebels rather than we're upholding the social norm. So that was what drew me into that. Did you, seeing it through that lens, are you like, oh, this is a cinematic masterpiece now? I, well, yeah, totally. Like, looking at it, I mean, I can see your 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 critical analysis is right on. I thought it was interesting, though, like their their rebellion is actually pretty, pretty wimpy. I was actually kind of annoyed at how ineffective the rebellion was for, for the most part, because the Horde, I mean, they really should have lost, but the Horde has all this, has all these machines and, and weird, like, and robots and drones and everything, and the rebellion mostly has pitchforks. Like, I was paying attention to the weapons, and pitchforks were the vast majority of weapons used against this this massive horde of robots hurrah <laughs> yeah exactly i i really think that the rebellion kind of talked themselves out of a lot of stuff i think my favorite example of that was when they were like oh we can't go up against the harpies they're so powerful and like literally shira and he-man trick the harpies in like a fifth grade maneuver and they're just gone you know, they never get back up from that, even though they just smashed into each other. Well, and that whole part of the movie, too, was kind of strange because it didn't have anything to do with the rest of the movie, and it only lasted like 10 minutes. Y yeah, well, I guess it had to do with the rest of the movie in the sense that they rescued Angela, the queen of the land, in order Who to... Who also wasn't ever mentioned, though, before... Like, that happened an hour into the movie, and an hour into the movie, we find out that there is a queen to the land who needs to be rescued, but... Like, she'd never been mentioned before. Now, I, to be fair, it is four separate episodes that are just kind of cobbled together. Which, did you watch the director's cut, or did you wimp I, out and watch the regular version? I really don't know. I just searched 
for Shira on YouTube and clicked on the Shira movie, and that's that's what I watched. The the director's cut is an hour and thirty six minutes as opposed to the hour and twenty two of the regular one. So I don't know. Maybe maybe things I'll talk about you'll be like I I don't I don't know, and we'll we'll find out that that okay. scene was one that was cut. But the <laughs> really quickly, Angela, the queen they rescue. I love the fact that He Man takes the collar off of her, which was. Im- impeding her powers, her magical powers, and then she's like, now I can use my magical powers, and she starts glowing, and you think it's going to be really impressive, and she cleans the dust off of herself with her magic. <laughs> yes, that's that's what happened. Let's talk about Hordak and how awesome he is. He is pretty cool, although I, I kind of wish Skeletor had been in the movie a little bit more, because they were cool together, like, when they met each other. That was also... Very similar to the fifth Harry Potter book in which everything was turned on its head. The whole finding out that Skeletor used to be part of Hordak's horde and then Skeletor betrayed him. Right, because he was his own, like he was his pupil and learned under him and then he went and re- like rebelled against his master or whatever. Yeah, there and I love their showdown at one point Skeletor, I think it's Skeletor, it's either, I don't know, I, probably it's Hordak who just says, this is stupid. <laughs> And I was like, preach on, brother. Uh, and, and then after that, they work together and become chefs. That's awesome. But yeah, so Hordak has, like, unlimited magic potential. He rules this land. My favorite thing about him is how he mugs to the camera. It's it's weird because he's kind of uh, uh, self-aware. And Skeletor is, let's put it this way, I'm in Camp Skeletor, if you get my drift. Uh, uh, the Skeletor is camp. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, uh, uh, which I loved as a kid. Skeletor was always the best part of He-Man. There was a kid I loved Cringer because I was like, he like Garfield. Like, what is it with okay, cats? Okay, can we talk about Cringer though? Because he was the worst character in the entire movie. I never watched He-Man, by the way. I, I, I never saw that cartoon. I never, I, so I didn't know any of these characters. I didn't know anything. And like one of the first characters you meet is this awful, awful tiger. Like he's so horrible. Everything about him is just the worst thing ever. I, I made a note. I was like, wow, Cringer, one note, one single note at all in the entire film and that note is is can we eat I, it's just <laughs> i don't think he has any other line except like oh, no, no food, Adam. I, yeah wow. his his voice is just the worst i just i just couldn't <laughs> stand him i loved cringer as a kid and i think it's because he reminded me of garfield because it was like a cat who loves to eat and i like cats and i like eating so Ergo See, the, the thing I got from him was that he was just, he's just a coward. Like, he just runs away. That's, like, that, I thought that was his personality trait. <laughs> How did you get that? I mean, just because he's named Cringer? I... <laughs> well, no, like, he, that's why he's named Cringer, right? Cause right, he, cause I'm he... teasing, yeah, yeah, because he, yeah, it, it, it is, it is. He should have been named, like, Eater Cat, though, as far as I'm concerned, because <laughs> I I think his cowardice comes out of the fact that he's like, if I were to die, I wouldn't be able to keep eating. <laughs> I guess that's valid. <laughs> yeah, Cringer, Cringer did not live up to my memories. I was very sad to see that, that little, uh, that little memory destroyed, that... That little uh, uh, dream <laughs> dream killed there. So another <laughs> thing about Hordak, I'm just going to keep going back to Hordak, basically. Another thing about Hordak is I want to know who his fucking engineer is. Because so many of his pieces of machinery that he uses are just batshit. They are. I noticed the technology in the show, like, it, it makes no sense. I was particularly mystified by their their big huge weapon that they was the supposed Magna to be the big beam. scary thing. Yes, the teleporter that was not powered by electricity, but instead by human willpower. Right. Like I kept which they I, must I, drain I wrote from I kept prisoners. thinking, you know, because there were what, approximately eight million characters in this show. I Yeah, kept there were thinking, way too many. <laughs> I kept thinking they would introduce like a mad scientist character or something who created this. And and the reason that I thought that was simply because Hordak doesn't say, like, it's my creation. You know, he's like, oh, it's right. nearly completed, as if there is an engineer. And, and so I kept waiting for that engineer to be introduced because I was like, who the hell is create? Because first of all, it's created on, it's, it's, it's run by willpower. And then it's got a really shitty capacitor. It's like one strong-willed peasant gives it like one 
Unless you're He-Man, though, and then you have to be careful not to overload the machine. Right. (laughs) And then when he says, oh, you have to be careful not to overload it, and it's like, this capacitor is just shit, right? And then (laughs) She-Ra deflects that beam that he shoots with a rock, and he's like, well, I've got time for one more shot. And it's like, how? You just made a point of saying that it had to be at full capacity to do this. Yeah. And then he can turn into a fucking rocket anyway, and it's like... Well, if he can turn into a rocket... And a drill. Yes, and a drill, which I, I forgot because it's essentially exactly the rocket except with a little drill on top. Right. But, you know, flexible. <laughs> Hordak just seems to be all over the map, and I, I found him fascinating. Also, did you notice that he gets a mini-me for one scene? I, I didn't notice that. Okay, maybe that was one of the deleted scenes. Yeah, he gets a little imp who's just a little blue Hordak imp they're by him kind of laughing at things for one scene and it was like what is this imp does is this a hordak's baby what the hell is going on here (laughs) we should talk about the material physics of the show and since we're talking about the technology because like i said before the the rebellion has pitchforks and they i mean i guess they they work perfectly well because they work just fine but through the show they're punching through things and like breaking through doors and shooting bow and arrows at things that are made out of like stone and metal and then they just destroy them with with the the wimpiest of things it did seem like there was maybe a disconnect between the script phase and the art phase <laughs> like perhaps well, i'm sure there was of some kind <laughs> uh bow who uses a longbow. Right. Uh, Very creative naming choice there. <laughs> also, who dresses <laughs> as if he's going to, I don't know, like a like a gay rave or something? Oh, man. Okay, the costumes in this show, they like they hurt to look at. Like I like it was it was giving me pain to look at these costumes on these people. I, I gotta admit though, I always wished I could pull off the Prince Adam look. I thought that was awesome. I love the fucking purple tunic do you see what i was saying now about prince adam dressing like uh the prince except obviously prince adam is like you know schwarzeneggerized version of that prince right uh but but that purple tunic white undershirt and a belt man if i could pull that off i would be one of the <laughs> happiest people on the planet i wouldn't i would wear nothing else oh and i'd love to see that and i would always talk in that slightly smarmy voice <laughs> mm-hmm well, Cringer, we'll see what we can get over here. <laughs> is he okay? So I have a question. Like I said, I didn't see the show. Is he like? Does he like change personalities when he becomes He Man? Because it seems like like does he become a totally different person? Because everybody else seems to treat them like different people when they transform. Right. Well, it, it's you know it's supposed to be that sort of Superman thing. My main problem with that is this is a good example of with both him and adora slash shira it's 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 an example of like one of my big problems with the show is that prince adam's pretty much a badass on his own like he takes care of three horde robots on his own with i guess Bo helps out a little bit but essentially you're like this story doesn't really necessitate he-man or she-ra in any way it it also doesn't necessitate the yeah the, all the other characters that are involved for no good reason <laughs> no. and some of them are really are all were also just really unpleasant to watch they were just some of them didn't make any sense there were that witch creature and the little i don't know they were strange Right, there's there's kind of a... It almost makes me feel like maybe originally Etheria was meant to be more, I don't know, closer to like a steampunk sort of world, and magic wasn't going to exist there, and then the magic seems kind of thrown in at the last second, you know? Like, yeah, the, ma- the yeah, magic does. doesn't really seem to fit. I think my favorite, talking about the bad uh, outfits for everybody, I think my favorite was Bo and the Sorceress. Favorite thing about the sorceress, she sleeps in her bed wearing a giant bird headdress. <laughs> and I'm like, who does that? But I, you, when would you ever get to sleep? Also, you take that thing off and her hair is going to be all matted and full of maggots and shit. Ugh. She, she was kind of weird too, though, because she got the whole story started, but there was really no reason for the story to begin. Like, there was nothing 
They had, they had to get He-Man into the other dimension somehow. It was very arbitrary. It felt to me a lot like the uh, the Dungeons and Dragons show where the dungeon master would be like, okay, now you got to go into this town and fight a slime monster. Uh, what? We don't go, you fuckers. We got 22 minutes to fill here. <laughs> right. The sorceress is kind of creepy also, like in general. You know, first off, she's just like, hey, Adam, I want you to go through this mysterious <laughs> portal. Take a sword and... Eh, figure it out and he's like well i don't really know if i'm go and then <laughs> and then you find out that she literally wiped the minds of everybody on eternia oh uh, yes for for no good reason except that they kidnapped a baby and then got defeated like there was no reason to to wipe everyone's memories of that event and yet for some reason they did. Yeah, it was within a generation because, I mean, Adora can't be over 30, right? So, right. So it was within, like, I, I would say maximum 25 years ago that their entire world was also ruled by Hordak. And Hordak stole a royal baby. And so, I don't know, in order that the people wouldn't have to live with the guilt of losing Adora... She completely wiped everyone's memory of the Horde ever being there. And it's like, yeah. what do the older people think about Eternia like 30 years ago? Let's just go through some characters and talk about them. Shadow Weaver, to me, seems like Orko's evil grandma, maybe? Oh, yeah. She was she was kind of an interesting like sidekick slash counterpart. I'm not sure what... Because, I mean, he, he did most of the the cool stuff and she he being hordak yeah yes yeah i don't know for a second though her relationship with adora was kind of creepy that was another thing that i think i liked about this was the fact that adora was obviously in this like fucked up non-consensual mind control fanfic the whole time right <laughs> maybe i'm crazy but i i also did feel that hordak had some feelings for adora like he had actually come to love her as a father in some ways well, I, I felt like it was more that he was kind of possessive of her. I guess we should describe for the listeners that the, the plot that Adora goes through is that she grew up in this this evil compound, essentially, Hordak's evil compound, not knowing that the Horde was evil, not knowing that, that she was on the wrong side or whatever. And so she gets to adulthood not understanding that she's on the wrong side, and then He-Man comes and like tells her, hey, you guys are evil, and she doesn't believe him, and she has to go and find out on her own. And then we find out that the the Shadow Weaver has cast like mind control spells, and that Hordak has kidnapped her from from Eternia when she was a baby. And yeah, you're right though, because when she when she goes back to Eternia, like he freaks out, like he's like, no, she will not be taken from me, type of thing. Yeah, and I maybe I was totally projecting, but I thought there was a little more than just possession there. I thought it was it was a kind of love, but... Well, very possibly. I, I don't know. Perhaps I'm... you picked up on some subtext. <laughs> or perhaps I'm remembering later episodes. Who knows? And, and the thing that's interesting is that she isn't able to figure this out for herself because according to her, she spends so much time alone in the Fright Zone practicing. And I'm like, there's clue one, that your practice area is called the Fright Zone. Right. Beyond that... In all their, like, group powwows, Hordak refers to their horde as evil. Right. He's not hiding this. I mean, is it literally like he tells everyone now when Adora's in the room, Ixnay the evil I, I mean, is that how it works? Like, I, I don't know. That seems it's, very... It's entirely a mystery to me how secrets are kept or not kept in this <laughs> in this movie because, like, the Eternia thing, too, when everybody's mind got wiped oh, of the horde, God. like, that's a, that's a huge... Secret to keep, you know? Yeah, then, and, and and with Adora, later on, she's helping take in an entire town to become slaves because one townsperson spoke out or said something bad or something like that. No, he literally asked them to apologize, and they arrested an entire village and sent them to prison. And And she's taking them into slavery... And she doesn't seem to understand what slaves are. Yeah, yeah, I guess not. Though, also, the Horde doesn't really seem to understand what the purpose of slaves are either. Did you notice on Beast Island that they just march the slaves around? We never see them doing any work? Yeah, but I guess someone has to do the work to make all this cool, wacky, engineered technology, right? R right, There, maybe we just never see, see that. Okay, so back to characters. 
Madame Raz is Orko's fucked up aunt. She's, wow, Madame Raz. Like, what the hell? I remember always, like, being angry at her as a kid. Why would you say sheep when it's obviously sleep? Like, I, does she have Alzheimer's? I don't understand. In general, wouldn't you think you would be terrified of having a magician who was that stupid on your team? Well, you'd think. Like, you know, it's like, oh, razzle-dazzle, dizzle-da, uh, let us all burst into flame. Whoops! I mean, it just... <laughs> a leech? What do you think of leech? I, which one is that again? I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't keep track of these characters. There were so many, and they were so unnecessary. They just did not contribute to the story at all. They, they did not. They're, and, and my thing was like, they obviously at this point had like, a, a, like you know, 28 or whatever episodes ordered. So why did they feel the need to introduce them all in these first yeah, few episodes? Know. Leech was the the blue horde member who had the like suckers for hands and oh the one who like drained drained the whatever out of their heads right the energy or whatever and the thing that i loved is that the f leech figurine just had these like round suction cup things because they couldn't get the leechy like webbing in between the fingers to work very well so they just put a giant circle over it and then mm -hmm. the cartoon just did that too rather than showing what they were obviously going for which i thought Maybe was it was just easier that way uh he had a lot of spit he was he was very his mouth full of a lot of spit that was my note on him because he always he talked like mild energy <laughs> Oh, you, you do that very well. Take you down. <laughs> and Mantana. Oh my god, Mantana. I fucking love Mantana. I love that figure. You could push a little lever on, on his back and his eyes would pop out. Had those four legs for no goddamn reason. Love that character. Yeah, he was he was really weird. <laughs> I I liked him. I I just I I can't I just couldn't keep track of these. Although the ones I noticed were Glimmer was kind of interesting. She she like has a thing for He Man, right? Is that a, is that a thing? Because she gave him the eyes when she met him. It certainly seems so. And she, but she was also kind of useless. Like um, when the suction cup guy like grabbed her head, she doesn't even try to get away or or like push him away. She just kind of stands there and lets it happen. It seems as if every character in here is capable of defeating any other character no matter what, but then a lot of times they just forget that they have magical powers in order for another character to show off. Yeah, and I guess that makes sense for how not thought out the writing was. Yes. Though this was co-written by Larry Dottillo, who was one of, I think, the better writers on kids' shows at the time. He and Chuck Dixon were both... Their episodes mostly hold up pretty well, I think. And so... Do you think they're responsible for this? The, I noticed a parallel between Star Wars. Like, the Luke and Leia thing was, was very similar to, to Adora and Adam, how they at first didn't know they were siblings and then they found each other and i thought there was some weird sexual tension there but then oh wait they're twins and then then like they they get to rule in separate places or whatever it's very possible uh i would not put it past him especially considering this was made in 85 jedi came out in 83 so okay. uh so this was that was still fresh on everyone's mind in general however Everybody seemed to have a little bit of sexual tension. Everybody rode so goddamn close to each other on horses or on ships or anything like that. And their costumes were all very, like, could easily suggest that as well. Watching this, you could very easily imagine a kind of uh, sex party where people dress up as He-Man characters and put some oil on and then just kind of... Well, let me ride right behind you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's just get on the cat here. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Drive a little faster. Like, at times, you kind of expected Prince Adam to be like, Bo, you want to wrestle? It seemed like Bo had a thing for, for He-Man, for sure. I think Bo had a thing for everybody. I think Bo, who looked like Douglas Fairbanks, so I liked that, but I, I think Bo had a thing for everybody. Very possibly. So, the good guys that we haven't talked about yet. Let's see, Prince Adam. Prince Adam starts out, we see him cooking something, and it's obviously not the castle where he lives, so I was like, did he just bust into some random peasant's house and be like, hey, give me your chicken, I want to make some chicken. I mean, does he do that? 
<laughs> okay, so where where does he live though? Does he live at Gray Skull? Yeah, yeah, he lives with his parents. Yeah. Okay, because I. I, I mean, thought I... it was odd too. Later, when Adora she finds so she finds this magic sword that's meant only for her or whatever, and like immediately she becomes loyal to Gray Skull, but she's never visited and has no idea what it is. But from that moment onward, her phrase is for the honor of Gray Skull. In contrast to by the power of Gray Skull, which was interesting. I was wondering if there was some sort of like deep meaning we could glean from glean from that dichotomy that is the big kind of elephant in the room that i want to get to in a, in a in a little bit here but quick note about cringer we've already talked about cringer but do you notice how creepy it is when he actually does eat i i didn't notice that he sucks the flesh off of a fish without actually eating it <laughs> hmm. it's terrifying to watch did you at least like battle cat yeah although his armor seemed really it seemed as bad as the other costumes, but it seemed like really impractical for a cat. It was really bulky, and then it covered his nose so that he couldn't smell anything. What's up with that? He doesn't He's need to. He doesn't need to smell, man. It's like if it's in front of it, he fucking attacks it. That's all Battle Cat <laughs> does. All right. <laughs> I I found it a little weird that ba both Battle Cat and Cringer can talk, but Shira's horse only talked when it got transformed into Swift Wind because it was what Spirit as a regular horse. Right, and then and then got a different name and became yeah. and became sentient, presumably when you know <laughs> transformed, and then goes back to being just just a normal horse again. Like, does it? I, it's very flowers for Algernon, all tied up in there. I thought Swiftwind was kind of creepy. Swiftwind gave me a kind of a child abductor vibe. Did you get that? Oh no, I I didn't get like as a little girl, I would have I would have loved it because I like I loved unicorns and horses and stuff. So I I don't know. Right, and obviously that's. What they were going for, right? They were trying to tap into into that, but I right. I found the voice that they used for him because I was like, why wouldn't Swiftwind have a girl's voice? Oh. Do, do little girls want like a, a male unicorn? I mean, I, I, possibly. I, <laughs> and Spirit I mean, not? to me looks very feminine, but then Swiftwind, which is a, a Pegasus, uh, Swiftwind is like, hey, Shira, pop onto my back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's take a ride down by the school. <laughs> and we've talked about Adora and her trials. Let's talk about He-Man and She-Ra, who are really just slightly more muscular versions of their regular selves, I think. I mean, I, I, mean, I guess incredibly more muscular. He-Man punches yeah. tanks. Pushes over a stone prison as well. And and Shira like has I I don't know what her powers are because at one point she picks up that gigantic boulder, just way too huge. <laughs> at another point she like telepathically communes with a bear, and then at another point she heals her horse. Like what are her powers exactly? Do they describe them in detail? And I liked Skeletor's line, a female he man, this is the worst day of my life. <laughs> Skeletor really got the shaft in this movie. I, I He felt... did have some good lines, though. He did. He definitely did. But I felt really bad for him in that flashback where the sorceress is explaining everything. And it's like... And then he turned on us. And you see him, like, cowering on the ground. And it was like, oh, Skeletor. Yeah, I don't I don't know him that well. like, But I do know him from, like, memes and stuff. But right. that's, that's about it. We've talked about Bo. One thing I want to say about Bo... Bo very calm in a crash. Did you notice that he was like, somebody might want to do something here? <laughs> <laughs> okay, but is that due to the character or just the, the bad voice acting, which was prominent throughout the entire show? <laughs> you the shut the hell was... up, Misha. <laughs> <laughs> the worst was the queen, the Angelus queen or whatever her name was. Like, yeah, she it, was it's... really, really bad. Angela. Oh, and Yeah, okay. Angela. Because it's like Angela, but she's an angel. Ah, uh, yes. See, it's fucking clever is what it is. <laughs> They're definitely going for that very arch sort of reading on every line. I did like the fact that, uh, oh, what the hell was his name? Craven or Clower or whatever, the little flying Monchichi monstrosity thing. Oh, yeah, I didn't know what that was. He got a lot of lines, too. Yeah, he was kind of the she version of Cringer. I, I did like... That, like, he at least wasn't as bad as Cringer. 
Well, he had more of a personality, at least. There was there was a bit more there. He was he was I wouldn't say he was three dimensional, but <laughs> <laughs> certainly not. <laughs> but the but the voice acting, no. I mean, there was no standout. I mean, I don't know. I, Skeletor for me stands out. Uh, everybody else is kind of and Hordak, of course, right? Yeah, I like the fact with Hordak that he didn't that, that they didn't go for a Skeletor ish like <laughs> that. He was a little more subdued. A little bit. He had he had his things though. His little um, like his weird little snort, and then his laughter. Oh, he was just his, his laughter snort. was good. His pig snort got really annoying. One more quick note: Beast Island had only one beast. Did it even have that? What beast did it have? Remember the big beast that Bo shoots something and it falls on its head. Oh, vaguely. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, one last thing about He Man too. He sheds one tiny tear at the end of it. Oh this. yes, I remember that. When it, when Adora leaves back to Etheria, right? Yeah, I, I Just really the tiniest little tear in the world. <laughs> I really wanna know did they have to like have hours long conversations? Because it was so ridiculously tiny that, that <laughs> I, I really wanna know were they like, Well we can't like puss out He Man. But right, we, we can't let him cry. Right, but if we if we just have a tiny, tiny tiny tear i want to believe the animation came back and they were like that tear's too big that tear's too big to get back to the drawing board until it was this like it, it looked like he might have just had like a, a spry lice on him or something <laughs> yeah so the the big thing that i want to talk about is this is ostensibly a story about a female superhero similar to Xena, right? This has the potential to be an incredibly powerful feminist statement, right? Mm -hmm. And I kept getting so many mixed messages. I wouldn't say it was anti-feminist, but it really just seemed to kind of uh, blithely ignore the the, the opening that they had here to do such a thing. On one hand, I thought it was interesting that there was way, way more beefcake than TNA, which I thought was kind of unusual for an 80s cartoon. But I mean, when Prince Adam becomes He-Man, he's just got a fucking, like, bared chest with a, like, a a bandolier strap, and that's it. Yeah, between him and Bo, like, they're, they're, like, rippling muscles (laughs) the whole time. It was very, like, they were very prominent. Whereas the women were all, uh, there were a couple of them that had, essentially they were wearing teddies, but they weren't really pronounced, I didn't think. And for the most part, the women were wearing fairly sensible clothing, or fairly appropriate clothing, I felt. Yeah, for, like, in comparison. So it had that on one side coming down in a kind of feminist, uh, uh, I don't know. I, I I don't know if that's necessarily feminist, but but at least not a uh, not an exploiting women sort of way. But then on the other hand, it seemed you know you brought up the whole sword difference thing. He man's is by the power of Grayskull, very masculine, uh, phallic sort of imagery, and hers is for the honor of Grayskull. Very you know, Shira has to keep the honor intact. That's her job. That's the that's the woman's job is, is yeah keeping... and that's yeah the, you're, you're right that has ties to other like I, I don't I don't yeah I don't know what what the difference is either though in like for the characters doesn't mean anything no not a bit though if Shira has premarital sex she explodes in the flame <laughs> wish we could have seen that one <laughs> hey man my hymen what's happening <laughs> ah! You gotta wonder what that what that hymen is like for for like a superhero type person. Yeah, she, well, she would have to have sex as a Dora first because if you tried it with Shira, it would be uh, only He Man would be able to do it, and that would be weird, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. There's there's the line that's not very ladylike, which I can't remember. I wrote that down, but I can't remember who said it. So I think it was a good guy though, and I think that's why I noted it. Also, at one point. And this isn't necessarily pro-feminist or not. This is just weird. But He-Man's like, oh, thanks for saving me from that horrible harpy or whatever the hell it was. And she says, what are sisters for? And I'm like, oh, okay, that's what they're for. That's what they're for. Rescuing you from murderous beasts. Good. I'll note that. (laughs) He also later in that scene says, quick, let's cross swords. Which they don't know could do anything. And it seems... A little, yeah, I think there was innuendo there. There, there, yeah, there could have been. But, it, you know, it worked. It, it deflected the thing and killed the harpy pr- pretty easily. Right. 
But in general, I I felt like this could have been so much more empowering for young girls, and I just don't think it was. I think it was... I think it was like, yeah, you could be like a strong, cool female warrior, but you're still like, you're still no He-Man, you know? Can you describe what you would have wanted it to look like? Like for if for that, if it were going to be more empowering, what, what would that look like? I, I think if there were just one or two more lines, you know, her being like, I'll show you what a girl can do. Or, you know, if, if, if Skeletor was like a, you know, a, a female He-Man, pa, or whatever, something like that. Or, or, you know, one of the bad guys said something like that. And she was like, you know, it's like uh, Nick Cage and Con Air. I'm going to show you there is a god, you know, just a, but I'm going to show you what a girl can do. You know, something like that. A moment mm-hmm. like that, I think. I think that's all that they necessarily needed, but instead... Well, you could, stay, you could say that without that, like, it's just more understated, which isn't necessarily bad, because if you overstate it, then it's... Yeah. Then it almost becomes... I, it, I do I feel know. like possibly this was brilliantly feminist by understating it, because, for well, instance... brilliant. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> but you do have... I believe the first person we see getting taken captive is He-Man, which was pretty yeah. shocking. And then seeing him... Oh, yeah. And then he's on that bondage table for a while. That was fun. Right. There, there's a lot. There is just a lot of beefcake in this movie. And a yes. lot of uh, a lot of twisted sexuality, which I think must have been part of why I enjoyed it. But he's just there like, oh, <laughs> let me out. Let me... Oh, God. The, I need the oil. The oil's so bad. Yeah, like we see several shots of him struggling against his chains as he's bound to this table helplessly watching while the villains like plot their whatever they're doing. Right, and Angela is all like with the giant slave collar around her neck and like a Korean pose, her head <laughs> yeah. tilted to the ground very subserviently. All hope has been crushed from her. Dirt smeared and, you know, filth covered. I they're, they're, this That's why they don't mention her until Act 3 because to bring up a woman in bondage too early would make it seem like that's all women are, objects and, and uh they, they didn't do the like Adora gets kidnapped, the men. No, yeah, she ha- but she does I mean she does have to escape her social brainwashing, you know, pretty much, which is I I, I mean it has parallels also with uh society nowadays in, in certain ways. Yeah, she's essentially Shadow Weaver is giving her Cosmo and telling her this is how a lady should act. Mm. And <laughs> Uh, Hordak is her overprotective father, who's like you or, can't, you, or whatever he is to her. Right, you can't, you can't sleep with strange men. That's that's the that's totally the. I don't know. I'm I'm really out on a limb here. I don't know. One last note on Hordak before we wrap this up. The Magna Beam's whole point that he's going to use it for is he's going to zap uh what is it brightwood forest or whatever zap the forest where all the rebels are and put it into like the lost valley or some shit like that which is this terrible place that's in the middle of nowhere or some some... and he uses it to dispose of his garbage at one point does he like yeah like he had takes this non-working thing and he's like we'll just we'll just put it here (laughs) because you can never come back from that so i'll just put the garbage here You would think you could have repurposed it, but I guess maybe they already got all the good parts out of it. But my thought is, no matter how kind of desolate a valley is, if you take an entire forest and put it in a valley, don't you just have a forest now? I I suppose so, but then, like, I guess you still never get out of it, and that's that's what he wanted. So maybe it was really far away as well? They never describe where it is, either. It could be in a totally different dimension, you know, since they do that sort of thing, so who knows? I guess that's possible, but then that means all the rebels are in a dimension that's free of Hordak with a life-sustaining forest around them. It yeah, seemed... so we should have just let them win. Exactly, yeah. The, this, the whole rebel plan at the end was really just a shit plan. It was like, if, if they would have just stayed out of the way... <laughs> then they could have lived happily ever after. <laughs> so, Marisha, if you could change one thing about this to make it way better, what would that one thing be? Well, I think they should have drastically reduced the number of characters, and then I think you're right, put more time into developing the familial slash, I don't, I don't know, whatever tension was between Hordak and Adora, so that whole story about Eternia 
and everything would have made more sense. Yeah, this this should be a story about Adora's awakening and finding out that her entire life has been a lie and and struggling with that concept, right? And instead, it's right. just it's He-Man punching tanks for half the story. Yeah, and she goes through her little like transformation of of the mind or whatever, but it only lasts like ten minutes, and then it's over. Yeah, it, it really doesn't have much uh, much staying power. Changing something here, do we have to play by the rules of the show? You know what I mean? Like, like if I'm like, I wanted full insertion shots, would that be not <laughs> playing fair? Because that... you could say that's cheating, but I like I'd allow it. So <laughs> more sexual tension between Bo and everyone. Yes. And more, oh, where the hell was I going with that? Uh, and, <laughs> shit. So, yeah, I, I think that's it. For now, this is Michael T. Bradley. This is Marisha Parker. And if you have watched it, if you haven't watched it, if you have any sort of comments or feedback, please write to info at iceonmars.net and tell us what you think. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. You have been listening to Ice on Mars. Goodbye.